Well, we have people still gone for the week of the 4th. I hope you had a good 4th. We did. I went to the fireworks show. And I saw somebody put something on Facebook, and they said they did not want to see anybody's fireworks on Facebook this year. So you're not going to see mine. But uh, that thing went for 40 minutes. My brother-in-law and sister were here, and they lived down in South Florida. And they were fascinated. They said it was better than the one they had down there, our little bitty town. We may not do anything else, but boy, we can have fireworks. And they were spectacular. And I think heaven's going to have a lot of pretty colors. And maybe some big booms too, but in a good way. Because, I mean, I'm like a kid. I love those things. Anyway, it's my own little personal thing. Last week I spoke on uh, what is hell and where is it? And I thought that uh, possibly that a lot of you people would hit the unlike button or the unfollow button or the block button after that. But so far nobody is that I'm aware of. Maybe you did and I don't know it. But... Um, it was really exciting because so many people have uh, watched that this past week. I mean, you'd be surprised how many. Anyway, I was going to the chiropractor. Uh, I go every month or so just for a little tune-up. And a young man that works there, hello, my brother. <clears throat> he's not that young, but he's younger than me, so that makes him young. Right, Sue? Yes. Right, okay. And uh, my friend, she'll always be a little bit older than me, just a little bit. And uh, she's got me by a couple months. And, uh, but anyway, uh, he said, we were talking about you today. And I said, really? He said, yes. And I said, well, was it good? He said, well, yeah. And he'd watched the video. And he said, I didn't know he watched our stuff. And, and he said, you know, I've always had questions about that. And he said, we were talking about it in the office here with the staff. And I said, well, did you like it? He said, yes. In fact, you said something about, I can have the notes. Can I have the notes? And uh, Robinson, I, I, I thought I sent you notes, but I will send them again if you didn't get them. I will send them again. And uh, anyway, it was just really encouraging. Then I called my friend that had had some questions and wanted to know if I had anything on hell. And so uh, he, he kind of, and you know who I'm talking about, and he kind of encouraged me to start that and I thought about it for two weeks and last week we did and so I called him and I said well do you still like me and he said uh, yes and I said well I didn't know if you would after I shared that and he said you know if people have a problem with that it's just going to be their problem because you stayed in the scriptures and he said it was well thought out. He said it was logical and it built. And that's the way I try to teach is start here and then build on that. And so I'm not saying they're not areas that I'm not right in. Of course there are. You know, I've changed the way I thought in the last two years, let alone the last 10 years or 20 years. And it's called growing. We understand things that we didn't understand before. And sometimes when I read the Bible, even today, I'll just write a little note by it. And I say, I don't understand this. I don't fully understand it. And that's okay because God speaks to our heart as we're going. He just does. It's kind of like steering a ship, a big ship. You don't turn it around on a dime. You're going to turn up there. You start right here, and it's a gradual thing. Even big airliners, they don't, they don't do like a fighter jet and do this, you know. They don't do that. I'm glad they don't. They turn gradually. In fact, sometimes you really can't even detect when they are turning. So God is in the process of continually revealing stuff to us. I understand more now than I did when I was two. Now, my wife, if you check with her on a good day, she may say, I act like a two-year-old. From time to time, maybe I do. But you know what? I'm not a two-year-old, and hopefully I don't think like a two-year-old. Paul said that. He said there are some people that need milk, and if you try to force feed a child, a little child, steak, he'll choke on it, and you could kill him. But if at 40 or 50 or 60 or 30 or 20 or however old you are, if you're still feeding only milk, then that's a sad thing. And then there are those that base their theology not on what really what the Holy Spirit teaches on the inside or what the Bible teaches us. And they base their theology based on what others have said. And I'm afraid there are many, many of those around. There are many that have based their total theology on hell based on what somebody wrote about it. A fellow by the name of Dante, and he wrote a book called The Inferno, Dante's Inferno. 
and they're basing all that they believe from what they think is a punitive God that's in the business of punishing. And if you don't do right, he's going to kill you. Not understanding that he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I was praying about what to share with y'all today. And I was reading, praying, and I had thought, well, I'm going to do a follow-up on what I did last week, and I'm going to talk about heaven. Now, heaven is such a vast subject, it's really too much to cover in one, one time. You can't, because it's a really big deal. But I'm going to talk a little bit about this. I'm going to talk a little bit about the kingdom of heaven. And that's such a vast subject. If you do a study, if you type in the kingdom of heaven in a search engine, so much will come up. Couldn't cover it in a month, let alone one service. But I'm going to talk about, about the hidden treasures of the kingdom of heaven today a little bit. Just a few verses. Just a few. The kingdom of heaven is not what will be. That's what people think. One day they're going to die and go to heaven and everything's going to be glorious. And it is. But folks, heaven is not for when you die. It is now. There's literally heaven on this earth. In fact, the Bible says there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. You know where the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem is going to be? On this earth. But people have the idea that that's something way over there, way over yonder, as we say here in the South, way out there or even way up there. The universe is so big, we could never explore it in a lifetime. It's going to take eternity to explore the universe. Who knows what's out there? I don't know. But I can tell you this, God does, and God's in control, but I know this about eternity. You're not going to be bound by time because time's not going to exist. Even though you're going to have a body and people are going to recognize you, just like they recognize Jesus as he revealed himself to the people, but you're not going to be bound by space either. You're not going to be bound by time. You're not going to be bound by space. So eternity will be the forever right now. And it already is, even though we don't understand it. You see, because we're clouded now. We're trying to base all that we could possibly know about God from something that's clouded by time and space, and, and we can't know all that there is about God with those two perspectives, time and space. Time and space will not be like they are today. Now, having said that, I don't understand it, but I know it's true. Well, we're going to look a little bit in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44 through 50, and this is just a little bit. And hopefully I can dispel some false notions about this, and we're going to look at the kingdom of heaven. It says in verse 44, Matthew chapter 13, the king, and let me say this about Matthew. Matthew was written to the Jews. And so Jesus is the one talking here, and he's talking from a Jewish perspective, from a legalistic perspective. That's what the Jews knew. That's all they knew. But he's going to share grace from a legalistic perspective. Understand this. Jesus was the last, ready for this, Old Testament preacher. He was the last law preacher. He preached law because that's all they knew. But he preached law, and especially the Beatitudes, with the idea of you can't live up to it. He was the last Old Testament law preacher, but he ministered grace and only grace. So listen to this, knowing that. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. The kingdom of heaven, it's like a treasure. The kingdom of heaven is treasure. I'm going to say again, the kingdom of heaven is here and now. And I used to think the kingdom of heaven were only those that knew and believed. They were the only ones that this applied to. But it says right here, it's like a treasure hidden in the field and a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. The kingdom of heaven 
is purchased by a man. The treasurer didn't know it was a treasure. My daughter and son-in-law and their children, all five of them, and one of my sons and his wife and their children, they went out to uh, they went out to Waco, Texas, to be with my son that lives out there, and he's kind of alone as far as family goes. And they spent a week together, his two children, my son in Texas, and then the other the other seven. So there were nine of them there. His three children, excuse me, they just had another one, so that makes ten. There and the other three were, were on this this part of the country, but uh, really cool. On the way out there, my daughter and her family stopped in Murfreesboro, Arkansas. They went that way and they searched for diamonds. Now, do you know that diamonds were already in the field? There are diamond fields, and you purchase the field so you can get the diamonds. They were there. They're not added. It's not salted as some of these fake mines are. It's not salted. They were already there. But they didn't find any. But they're there. And just a week before, so somebody found a large diamond, and there have been some large, very valuable diamonds found there. Most of the diamonds are not in the U.S. Most of them are actually in Africa. But they're there, and they were searching for them. Well, this man, when he knew there was treasure there, he found it, hid it, went away and purchased the field so he could have the treasure. I'm going to tell you this. The man is none other than the man, Christ Jesus, who sold all that he had. He abandoned heaven to be born of a virgin, an incarnate man. He, was, he became man. He was always God, but he became physically man in time. I don't understand this, but he did. And he did this not so that he could just live a perfect life, although he did. And some people say he did it to pay the penalty for our sins, to satisfy the wrath of God. And what they're saying is, because God was going to kill somebody, and he decided to kill Jesus instead of you. Folks, God the Father and God the Son are one. God the Father and God the Son covenanted together on your behalf. And the first picture of that was in the Old Testament in the garden with Adam and Eve, and then he explained it to Abraham before his name was even Abraham, while it was Abram. And God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit cut a covenant among themselves for the benefit of man. And Abram, this, some people say it was just for him. No, it was for all men, because the blessing that applied to Abram was going to be for all the nations. This man sold all he had, forsaking what he was and who he was. Even though he was equal with God, he chose not to be. He shelved his godly powers and lived on this earth. All that he did was through the power of the Holy Spirit, just like you. All the things that he did, you can do. You say, no way, yes way. And then ultimately, he became sin. This is what he did. So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This was an exchange, an exchange life. And who did he do, do this for? Those in the field. The treasure. The man is Jesus. He sold all that he had. That's him selling out, becoming sin. So he could buy the field because the field had great value. Now, something else about this. This was for people that didn't know anything about this. Does it apply to you? Yes. You weren't born, but it applies to you. Did it apply to Adam? Yes. First picture of the cross was when Innocent blood was shed. An animal sh which had its blood shed. And he took the skins of that animal and made a covering for Adam and Eve. That's the first picture of the cross. I believe it was the lamb as if slain before the foundation of the world. You're that treasure. He goes and buys the field. You were purchased with a price. The price was the shed blood. That's the hidden treasure. People don't know it. Then there's a costly pearl in verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant 
seeking fine pearls. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, Jesus is the merchant. The fine pearls are you. And upon finding one pearl, one of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. I heard Adrian Rogers speaking on this particular verse one time, and he said he heard somebody preach it. And Adrian, Dr. Rogers, as I called him, was my dear friend. He was my friend, one of my mentors. He spent time with me. He wrote me letters for years until he died. I wrote him. I loved Dr. Rogers. I believe God showed Dr. Rogers some things that he'd not seen before he died. Why do I think that? Because I showed him no. I did share some things with him, but you know what? He received every word of it. What a man of God he is. And folks, if we're not learning right up until the end, we've probably, we've stopped it. What a special man. He was talking about this verse. He said he heard it preached. And folks, it was wrong what they said. And here's what they had said. And people may not come right out and say this, but they, they think it. They said that Jesus was the pearl. And they went and sold everything. They abandoned everything so that they could purchase Jesus. That is exactly wrong. Exactly the opposite. You were the pearl before you did anything. Before you did anything right or wrong. Before you were born. You'd already been chosen. He said he chose you in him before the foundation of the world. It says in love he predestined you to adoption as sons. You've done nothing good or bad. Have we sinned? Yes. But you see, as far as God is concerned, there is no sin to deal with because He became sin and died. And then again in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, when one died, all died. That's what it says. A preacher friend of mine one time, I was sharing this with the group, and he was in there. And he, after I finished, I didn't know how he would respond. He looked at me and he said, you know, verse 14, he said, that verse always bothered me because I knew what it said when one died, all died. And he's talking about the world. Seeking fine pearls and upon finding one pearl of great value, one, he went and sold all that he had and he bought it. You are the pearl of great price. You are the reason that Christ died. He didn't just die so that you wouldn't have to because, folks, you died too. When he died, you died. He didn't die so you wouldn't have to. He died knowing that when he died, you died. When one died, all died. But when one was raised, all were raised to walk in news of life and say, are they all doing that? No. Why? Because they don't know. People hadn't told them. You're the pearl of great price. You are the pearl of great price. Let me say it again. You are the pearl of great price. Now, in this same context, we see in verse 47, there's a little change here. And sometimes people think that, okay, God is changing everything. Now, understand, the pearl did nothing. You see that? The treasure hidden in the field. I'm going to say a diamond. It could be anything. The gold did nothing. The one who purchased it did everything. What is the value of gold? It's whatever people will pay. It goes up and goes down. What's the value of a diamond? It's whatever people will pay. It goes up and goes down. What's the valuable value of anything? I have a fine guitar. David's got some fine guitars. My guitar, truthfully, it's, it's the value that what people will pay. My guitar is it's an, it's an 11, 2011 model. I got a friend, Ron. He's got a 36 and some other, you got to think he's got a 37 too. And, and it's worth five figures, high five figures, nearly six figures. Six figures for an old guitar. Scarred up and beat up, but the sound, oh my. He let me play it one time. And, I didn't just hear the sound, I felt the sound. I, I, when I think about it, I get goosebumps even now. When I played that first chord and I did some little runs on it, and I thought, oh my goodness. Just playing it makes you feel better. It really does. Sound does that. 
What makes it have great value? He could buy a new guitar. He could buy a lot of new guitars for the value of that old guitar. It's what people will pay. That's you. Verse 47, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. Let me stop right here. We live about two hours from the coast where we are right here. You know, Jekyll Island and St. Simons is about two hours away. And Jekyll Island sometimes, many times, most times, it's kind of a cloudy beach. The sand is stirred up because they're always shrimping right off the coast. And they take a drag net and they drag it down there and you'll see those boats and they'll have the outriggers out and they'll have nets out there and they'll just drive slowly or down the coast and pick up shrimp. People fish the same way. The kingdom of heaven is like a drag net cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. Folks, that's exactly what Jesus did. He gathered all men. People struggle with that. People struggle with that. He gathered all men. Let me ask you a question. Who did Jesus die for? All. all. Okay. Who's the Son of God? Now this freaks people out. Paul said this, and I'm not going to I'm not going to tear it up today with you, but I'm just going to tell you Paul said that. He was talking to the Greeks there at Mars Hill, and he said, we're all sons. Whose image were we created in? The image of God. Okay. This net that has been drugged over the whole world, by who? By the merchant. By the one dragging the net, the same one, the same context, the one who found the pearl of great price, the one who knew about the treasure in the field. That's synonymous with Jesus. Let's say it another way. Who is it that gathers? You know, the, the Bible says you're going to see in a minute it's the angels. He kind of separates, but we're going to. Who is it that draws all men into himself? Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men into myself. Now, let me translate that a different way. Since I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. I wish I could say I thought that meant everybody's going to believe him. I don't necessarily think that. I hope I'm wrong. But I can tell you this, all men are being drawn to him. There's no middle ground. There are those that are glad and there are those that aren't glad. Those that are glad realize what Christ has done and given to them, not just life, but His life, and they're thrilled about it. And those that aren't glad realize that His life has been given to them. They may not now, but they will, and they're not glad about it. I used the illustration last week of my granddaughter that I love very much. Man, when she's happy about being with me and She'll move my arm, and if I'm laying down or wherever I'm sitting, she'll put her body in there between my arm and, and my body. She wants to be close. And if her brother was in the way, she'd either hit him or push him. <laughs> if she's two, he's four, and he'd let her, and she'd get in there. But she's the same little girl when we wouldn't let her push the button to close the door that pitched a fit. They didn't want anything to do with anybody, especially me, because I'm the one that picked her up off the parking lot while she was pitching a fit there at the hospital in Waco, Texas, she'd gone to see her brother, or sister, excuse me, her little baby sister. <laughs> it was really funny. She wanted Johnny. She didn't want me to hold her anymore because I represented the one that stopped her from doing what she wanted to do. She was mad. I'm the same one that loved her before. It's one person responding two ways. Well, I'm going to talk about two people responding one way. One is really glad at receiving the love of God. And there are those that are really mad about having to receive the love of God. That blesses one, torments another. Same God. God is pouring out His perfect love on the one that's glad, and He's pouring out His perfect love on the one that's not glad. And last week I equated the love of God with fire. We even use it like that. He's on fire for God. The Bible says God is a consuming fire. Who does He consume? Everybody. 
The love of God consumes everybody. Fire's a good thing. Think of it as a good thing. Well, when this dragnet comes and it drags on the whole world, not just the ocean, but the whole world, and draws everybody in. In verse 48, it says, And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach, and they sat down and gathered the good, and the fish is not in there, but it says gathered the good fish. It's, it was added into the English, into containers, but the bad they threw away. And I wrote beside that, Lord, I don't fully understand this. I don't. I don't, but I'm going to share some things with you. And it says, <clears throat> so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come, come forth and take out the wicked from the righteous. And I think you could substitute there those that have believed and those that haven't believed. And will throw them into the furnace of fire. And what did I say fire was? Fires, just picture when you see the word fire, the love of God. Throw them into the love of God, the furnace of the love of God, which in the Bible says in another place is seven times hotter than anything on this earth. The perfect, seven being the perfect number, the perfect love of God. Place them there and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I'm going to talk about furnace, weeping, gnashing, and throw away. <sighs> Looking at things the way we always have from our earthly mind, we consider this as God giving people what they deserve. And yet the love of God was poured out on all men. We know that the love of God, the nature of God, does not change in eternity. God is love, period. You say, yes, but God shows wrath in the word wrath. The word is orge. It sounds like what it means. It literally translates strong emotion. God is going to pour out his one strong emotion on all men, and that is his unbridled love. Some are going to be glad. Those that have believed and received, and some are not going to be glad. And this word throw away, it means to throw or, ready? Let go of a thing. It's going to let them go. It means to give over to one's care, uncertain about the result. I wrote this, to give over to one's self. Wouldn't that be horrible? What if you let a two-year-old do only what he wanted to do? He would be in danger of losing his life. When do two-year-olds pitch fits? When they don't get their way. When, in fact, getting their way could kill them. When a two-year-old sits down in a parking lot at a busy hospital on a 100-degree day when the parking lot is black asphalt and probably was 120 degrees, and you could blister. Literally, she could blister her little bottom. And I wouldn't let her sit there and pitch a fit, and I picked her up. When I picked her up, I have never seen her so mad. She was squirming. She was doing all that she could to get away from my grasp. Why? Because I loved her. And what I meant for love, she seemed like, it seemed to her like torment. That's the way it is. To give over to one's care. Hmm to give over to oneself, uncertain about the result. Cast into the furnace of fire. Let's look at the word furnace. I told you fire, love. Furnace, something that's used for smelting, getting out impurities. For burning earthenware, earthenware. We call those pots. They made pots, starts out with mud, becomes mud, it's just dirt. And they add some water to it, and they mold it, and it'll sort of dry, but it's still weak and feeble. And so what do they do? When you're making pottery, you know the last thing you do? You put it in a kiln, and you fire it. And it's a fire that's hotter than anything you use in your house. And at the end of that time, they take out a perfectly foreign pot or pottery, or China, and it's strong and has great value. And it's something used for breaking, baking bread. So when you see the word furnace right there, you think, oh, that's a bad thing. It's going to burn them up. No. Cleans them up. 
weeping. This word, they would be weeping and gnashing of teeth, weeping. Lamentation, the passionate expression of grief or sorrow. That's what that word means. Passionate expression of grief or sorrow. I believe it could be grief because they think of all the wasted time. Are people going to believe in eternity? I don't know. Some say always. Some say yes. I hope they're right. The Bible doesn't really clearly teach on this. But if they do, I'm all for it. I don't know. Passionate expression of grief. <laughs> it could be, I'm not getting my way. It could be that. Passionately. Because the perfect love of God, the fire of God's love is being poured out on them in the furnace that is designed for smelting, getting out impurities, or turning mud into something of great use. And they don't like it. They don't like it. But you see, we've always looked at it as a bad, wicked thing for this to happen when everything that God does is because of His love. Understand that. You need to look at this this way. This word gnashing. You know, it's not a word we use a lot. Gnashing. It literally means snarling. You ever been up to an old chained up dog? I don't believe in chaining up dogs, but if you see one chained up and his tail isn't wagging and he's going, don't pet him. Okay, rule of thumb, don't pet him. If you're in somebody's yard and the dog comes up to you and he's not even barking, barking dog probably not going to get you. You, you. A barking dog, but when you come up to a dog, he's going, again, don't pet him. Okay? That's right. Growling. Snarling. That's what that word means. Doesn't necessarily mean pain. Gnashing of teeth, he's in great pain. That's not what this word means. This is snarling, growling in the sense of biting. That's how they're responding to the love of God. God's love is a constant, poured out with fever heat, furnace heat. People are broken, or, or maybe not. Maybe they're just mad. Expression of grief or sorrow. And they snarl at the love of God. Do you see this? Do, does this change the way that maybe you think about what this was? We've had the idea, you better straighten up and fly right, because if you don't, God is going to get you. Well, I got news for you. One way or the other, period. He's drugged the net. God has got you. Not a question of going to. He has. You, whether you know it or not, you are a pearl of great price. You, whether you know it or not, you are the treasure that's been hidden in the field that's going to be purchased by the man. You are the pearl of great price where the man went and sold all that he had and came back and bought you one. In the field, it was a great number. But if it had been one, so you have a great number in the field and one with the pearl. You're both, the, you're one in the field. But if you'd been the only one, it was enough. And when they're separated, well, I got another thing. We'll talk about this in a minute. Who separated who? God did not separate himself from man in the garden, Adam and Eve, when they sinned. There was separation, but it was Adam and Eve that separated themselves from God. Adam and Eve hid from God. God sought Adam and Eve. Why? Because his feeling, his love toward them did not change. Their feeling toward him changed instantly when they sinned. They no longer saw themselves as someone that had relationship and fellowship and oneness with the Creator. They saw themselves as someone who had sinned and had no value. And then the one who had the ultimate value had to bring them back into himself and he took the blood and he covered them with the blood and showed them that what was theirs in the beginning is still theirs. And they just live like it's not. And that's what people are today. They're living like it's not. 
I think last week's message and this week's message really did need to go together. So you heard last week's message, and I mean, Andrew, you did, so I'm sure you both agree y'all were gone. So go back and listen to last week's. And uh, the love of God knows no boundaries. And there is no separation from the love of God. Some will be glad, eternally glad, and some will be mad. Hopefully their mind will be changed. I don't know. But I can tell you this. I'm going to tell them now that they are the pearl of great price, that they are the treasure that was hidden in the field, and that there has been a dragnet and God has drug all men, not just to himself, but into himself because of his actions, not theirs. Some of you, if you get mad, so be it. See you next time.